diesel engines deliver high torque at low RPM, are more economical and, because the fuel is less volatile, are less prone to catch fire. Since hardly any flammable vapors accumulate in the engine and transmission compartment. Even so, most German battle tanks in World War II ran on spark ignition gasoline engines. The reasons lay in a mix of technology, logistics, and industrial policy. After the Treaty of Versailles, tank construction was prohibited, know how and manufacturing depth declined. With rearmament from 1933 to 1935 onward, the Panzerwaffe needed one thing above all as many operable vehicles as possible, as quickly as possible. The 1933 Panzerkampfwagen 1 was built as a training vehicle with a simple carburetted engine because it was cheap and easy to produce and maintain. By 1939, series production of the Panzerkampfwagen 1, 2, 3 and 4 was underway. Even the more advanced Panzerkampfwagen 4 stuck with a Maybach gasoline engine. Early on, this cemented a gasoline standard across training, spare parts and supply. Resource-poor Germany relied heavily on synthetic fuels from hydrogenation and the Fischer-Tropsch process. These plants were under bombing pressure. Allocation was a matter for top leadership. Diesel was prioritized for submarines, many trucks and tractors, the railway and stationary sets, while gasoline, for example B4, supplied the Army and Air Force, and high-octane C3 was reserved for aviation. High-pressure injection equipment for diesels was a bottleneck, and large diesel allotments were earmarked for the Navy and transport. A broad shift to diesel in tanks would have strained the scarcest resource, whereas gasoline and Maybach spark ignition engines were already scalable. There were individual projects. For the VK, for Versuchskonstruktion, German for experimental design, 20.01 planned as a Panzerkampfwagen III successor, more powerful power plants, including diesel variants, were tested. Comparative trials, however, showed that the series-ready Maybach gasoline engine was economical enough and, above all, immediately available, whereas diesel would have forced new supply chains. Operationally, the 1940 Western campaign already exposed how fuel supply was tricky. Panzer divisions often kept up their advance only thanks to standard 20-litre jerry cans and airdrops of fuel. In the post-action reviews, this was judged primarily a logistics issue, not a motor issue. After the T-34 shock, the VK 30.02 competition began. Daimler-Benz's VK 30.02 D took heavy cues from the T-34, front-drive sprocket, leaf springs, low silhouette, and planned variants with the Mercedes-Benz 507 diesel family. Alternate layouts with a Mercedes-Benz 809 option also circulated. Machine & Fabrik Augsburg Nuremberg's VK 30.02 M used torsion bars, interleaved road wheels, and the proven Maybach line. Decision. Machine & Fabrik Augsburg Nuremberg, leading to the Panther with Maybach HL 210 slash 230, 650 to 700 horsepower. Decisive factors were the industrial maturity of the Maybach gasoline engines, parts commonality from Panzerkampfwagen 3 slash 4 through Tiger slash Panther, established workshop and spares logistics, ongoing diesel scarcity including injection hardware, and the judgment that the Daimler-Benz design offered less modernization headroom and, in the chaos of battle, its silhouette might even be mistaken for a T-34. A new tank diesel would have needed 18 to 24 months to reach a reliable series configuration. Testing, manufacturing, tooling, spare parts pipeline, and troop training included. From 1942 to 1943 onward, time, materials, and stable test conditions were lacking. Add winter factors, diesel can gel in severe cold and needs additives or preheaters. The Red Army managed this on the V2 diesel with winter measures. The Wehrmacht would have needed additional equipment for a hasty conversion. 
Weight and packaging also argued against a late pivot, since contemporary diesels of similar output were often heavier and bulkier. For tanks, specific power and compact installation matter. Gasoline is more volatile, no dispute. But across major armies' loss statistics, ammunition cook-offs after penetration were the most common killer. If an armor-piercing, high-explosive round struck the stowage, you got a cook-off. Measures like the Sherman's wet stowage cut losses far more than the fuel type alone. German tanks had fire suppression systems, but no consistent wet stowage. Diesel would have helped, but would not have removed the core cause, penetration into ammunition. In 1942, Ferdinand Porsche relayed the Führer's wish to transition vehicles to diesel step by step. A family concept with a few base displacements and varying cylinder counts was to unify production. Little of this was implemented. The situation on the western and eastern fronts deteriorated. Synthetic fuel output suffered under bombing, and Maybach's de facto monopoly in tank gasoline engines remained. A new standard simply came too late. With Case Blue in 1942, the Wehrmacht aimed at Caucasus oil. Had Baku or Maikop been secured long-term, large-scale diesel might have been theoretically feasible. Practically, time to series-ready engines, factory conversion, and field supply would have taken months to years. After Stalingrad, the oil hope was gone. The Navy and transport bound available diesel, and planners decided to stick with gasoline and keep up tempo despite all drawbacks. France, 1940, and the Eastern Front alike showed that the fuel column decides outcomes. Germany modernized containers and distribution. The Einheits canister was exemplary, fuel was airdropped, and captured fuel was used. All this facilitated gasoline operation and entrenched it further. Over the war years, the HL62-82-120 TRM family, around 300 horsepower, powered the medium Panzerkampfwagen 3-4. The HL210P45, 650 horsepower, powered early Tiger I, and the HL230P34, Panther and Tiger II. P45 for late Tiger I, delivered about 700 horsepower. Common interfaces, familiar peripherals, and well-rehearsed maintenance were, in the aggregate, more convincing than theoretical diesel advantages. Ironically, the Wehrmacht already fielded broad diesel fleets, for example, the Einheits diesel trucks of the 1930s. That proves the know-how existed, but the tank line remained gasoline for the reasons given. Two parallel fuel worlds already existed. A third, dedicated to battle tanks, would have complicated matters further. Concept papers repeatedly floated diesel panthers, mostly based on the MB family. Neither injection hardware nor diesel allocations nor packaging constraints allowed a wartime series. And even the compromise, gasoline first, diesel later, failed for lack of time and amid bombing pressure on factories. Post-war, diesel's delayed triumph. Only with the Bundeswehr did the concept finally take hold in the main battle tank line. From 1965, the Leopard 1 received the MTUMB 838, a liquid-cooled, multi-fuel V10 diesel, exactly what had been desired in the war but couldn't be afforded. Internationally, almost all nations eventually went diesel for main battle tanks. Germany used gasoline in its wartime tanks not because diesel was unsuitable, but because industry, logistics, timelines and priorities, submarines, U-boats, and transport, injection technology, Maybach's dominance, and entrenched standardization blocked a late conversion and operational pressure left no room for long-engine experiments.